Hey, I'm checking in with another video, this time a pitching video from smallballsuccess.com. Uh, I'm not a pitcher, and again, I'm not going to keep apologizing for that. If you can find better information from more experienced coaches about how you as a small player with a, a broad frame can participate in the pitching game, then <laughs> do it with my blessing. I just don't know that those guys are out there. As a kid growing up myself and as the father of a kid with a similar build, I have found that the information you get is the same that the big kids get. There's really no interest in trying to look for something that you, with your special body type, can do that the tall, thin kids cannot do. You just have to try to compete with them at their game and hope that somehow you're going to have an equal amount of success. Well, good luck with that. I've, I'm trying to go at this using scientific method, you know, I make a hypothesis and I go out and test it and yeah, I'm testing it. I'm not saying that I am a pitcher or ever was or could be a pitcher, but I have two arms and two legs, so I'm made like you. I'm a human being and what works well, what works better for me than maybe something else that I might do, like throwing overhand, uh, with proper extrapolation to you as a young person, might work that much better for you. You know, if I can throw 10% faster doing something, even though my 10% faster might be 65 miles per hour, maybe you're throwing 80, so you could get up to 88 if you try this. So that's what I'm offering you, and it's all suggestion, and feel th free to, there are no guarantees. You can try it or toss it out or do whatever you want to with it. I'm gonna try to run through six things here. Now. By the way, not all of these are of my own innovation. I've got my list here so I don't forget. Six is kind of a lot for me to remember. One is to point your toe a little bit inward on the rubber. I remember one of Paul Reddick's uh, coaches in one of their videos talking about this. I can't remember. It wasn't Brent Strong, but it was some guy who's a professional, recognized, successful coach. So I think that's, especially for what I'm going to show you, that's a very... Uh, useful technique. It's it's useful because we're throwing here, what I'm suggesting is an 830 arm angle, a little bit below uh, true straight side arm. I'm not throwing at 9 o'clock, but a little bit below. So I'm trying to actually swing my, no, well that's too much, I'm exaggerating. The uh, We'll get into that in a minute. I don't want to open up too much, but I want to open up the front foot a little bit and if I'm pointing the back foot toward the plate, it's easier for me to do that if I don't break my neck on this carpet. Um, I also find that if I bring the arm straight down as I'm getting ready to throw, instead of trying to wrap it back here, that that's very helpful. And this too, it's kind of stating Paul Reddick's wall drill from a different direction. Uh, Paul emphasizes that whether you're going overhand or like this or like that, but you don't ever want your arm to be hanging out behind the rubber. That does a whole bunch of things that throws you off stride. It doesn't channel your energy toward the plate in the most effective way. I wasn't even thinking of Reddick when I, it occurred to me that this was just the right way to do it, but after the fact, I realized, remembering what Paul's, uh, pedagogy is that, you know, that's that's exactly what he's saying. And it's true, if you bring your arm straight down and make it stay there, it's going to go back, but you're making, you're making it go back, you're creating that extension by your body going forward. You want the back hand to be extended and, you know, maximally extended and then snap it forward. That's where you get your velocity. But let the stride forward leave the hand behind. And that's uh, how you're going to get best control of the ball. You'll get best velocity. You'll uh, have the best chance of avoiding hurting your arm, too. Um, I can't remember if I heard this from someone else or not, but I have down here you have a little hop. I think this kind of ties in with the next item that I know never, no one has ever suggested this. 
And there are probably not many people who could do this, except for us who are short and uh, broad-framed, strong in the lower body. I'm suggesting that you kind of balance the top knee on the bottom one. So these could kind of go together again. I've got my toe pointed forward a little bit. I'm going to bring my arms straight down. Now I'm going to give a little hop. When I do that, I get so low that I can almost rest one leg on the other. I've got my, this is what I'm consciously trying to do right now as I learn the intricacies of this motion. I'm actually resting my top knee on, t on top of the bottom one. I think what that's doing, it's for one thing straightening my leg out. Remember, I almost tripped over the rug there a minute ago, but that's because I'm trying to keep this leg straight so that I can fold it outward a little bit. I want to open up that front hip because I am coming at 8.30 and I want a clean path right to the plate. But it's also important to, to get down and stay down as I follow through because how am I going to get into trouble doing this? Well, anytime you throw a sidearm and you're stepping out a little bit, your temptation, I think, is to throw your head back and open the shoulder up too much. And you're going to, to a right-handed hitter, you're going to go way outside. I still do that when I'm throwing out back sometimes. When I'm trying to put a little extra juice on the ball. I, I get too quick. And I do that, and I pull up. My front shoulder goes out, and I miss the target badly. And I probably am not throwing as fast as I could either. Sometimes, you know, uh, more is less. If you just slow down and stay in the track, do what you're supposed to do, I think you can actually throw faster that way. Um, so, yeah, opening the front foot, which I've spoken of before, that would be number five. And the final thing is... Uh, I haven't been able to do it since I've been holding on to this piece of paper, but I've found that if I finish with the high front hand, of course my glove is going to be on this left hand, but if I kind of finish with that hand up there, I think that helps me stay. So much of this is about staying down as I follow through. And I thought for a while, maybe if I go forward with uh, throwing a, front elbow, that'll help me drive, but uh, no, I found that that didn't help at all. I think it's much better to lift that hand up because I think that forces me to keep my head down. It's just so very important to, to if you're going to do this, if you're going to open up a little bit, uh, you run the risk of opening up too much and missing your target, going way outside. So that business of staying down is absolutely critical. Okay, point the toe a little bit toward the plate. When you start your wind up, go straight down with your arm. Don't fling it back. Give a little hop so you can get down. That's, uh, that's kind of cool. I'm excited about that. I actually, it, if you've got the strong lower body to do that, uh, you can tap into those muscles. I think that kind of cues in your your thigh muscle that, uh, hey, it's time for you to go to work. I think that creates some tension there that's productive. Uh, even if you can prop one knee on the other, I know how weird that sounds, but, uh, and then open the front foot up a little bit, maybe 15 degrees or so, not too much, and finish with your glove hand going high. I'm working on trying to do something like I did with hitting secrets from baseball's graveyard. I'm a long way from being able to put any book together about these guys. And again, I'm, I'm very much of a novice when it comes to pitching. But I got three guys that I recovered from some old newsreels just over the past few days. I've got Art Neff, any, how does he spell, N-E-H-F, Art Neff, sorry Art, he's five foot nine inches, Dickie Kerr, five foot seven inches, and uh, here's Willie Sherdell, who's five foot ten inches. Now these guys, even back in the, we're talking about, you know, 1910, 1920-ish, 
uh, even then, most of the pitchers were six feet. These guys are substantially, in the case of Art, substantially under, uh, and Dickey Kerr, 5'7". These are, these are not tall guys, but I could tell from the newsreels that they're throwing pretty much in this way that I'm talking about. That's really exciting to me because I think, you know, I wasn't even looking at those newsreels before I was uh, trying to, through my uh, own body, figure out how can I get the most velocity out of this body type. Now I'm uh, just starting to do this spade work and look for these guys from the past and see if they're there. So far, they are. Some of them are there. This is promising.